After reading Brokeback Mountain by Annie Prue, watching The Searchers, a Western classic, I really thought that Westerns weren't for me. Heck, I tried The Gunslinger by Stephen King, hoping that The King of Horror could change my mind. And I even read Red Country by my favorite author of all time, Joe Abercrombie, and it didn't deliver. <laughs> even though it was my favorite Western at the time. I thought that it was pretty safe to say that say one thing about Vera, say she doesn't like Westerns. <laughs> I just found them super lethargic and I never really got much, if anything, out of them. However, I was told that I cannot maintain my bad take about not liking Westerns until I read Cormac McCarthy. <laughs> well, I listened and... You were right. Hello, my name is Vera and I like to make thoughtful weekly videos about literature. I spent this past month reading four books by Cormac McCarthy. And can I just say, they were so amazing. I am so grateful that I was exposed to this author. And yeah, I really had like a crazy spiritual awakening or something because of this, because I didn't expect to love them as much as I did. I'll talk about the books in the order in which I read them. Also, do you like my cowboy hat? Um, I think it's very girly pop because there's like a little bow in the back. You know, I've been trying to improve my branding recently, so the, the cowboy hat has to have a bow as well. <laughs> the first book that I read was All the Pretty Horses and life-changing is is it too soon to say that i don't know um i love i love this book i love this book so much even as i was like prepping for the video and i was uh flipping through it there's so many things that i have underlined and just there's so many beautiful beautiful quotes i don't know it made me nostalgic even though i read this a month ago but what is All the Pretty Horses about? We follow a teenage cowboy called John Grady Cole, who is the last of these Texas Rangers that were in his family. And he wants to preserve his culture. So he sets off with his best friend, Rollins, and they journey into Mexico to work as cowboys. It kind of diverges from there. I, I think that it is useful to know the structure of this book before heading in because it can help you get through those first 100 pages, which can be quite tough. Off, but oh my gosh, oh my gosh, the payoff is so so there. So definitely, definitely persevere. The book is structured into four chapters. The first one is the journey into Mexico. The second one is pretty much a love story. The third one is about the justice system. I'll say that as vaguely as I can. And then the fourth one is the return. It's it's pretty much a very basic hero's journey, but it's super 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 effective. And what's more interesting is that every single one of those chapters gets progressively better. Now. Now, the first segment of their journey into Mexico, I think, is very much a litmus test. Not a lot happens, but the scenes that do happen have major thematic repercussions later on down the line. Now, that being said, the more obvious passion and emotional sequences start in chapter two. I think this is quite obviously done on purpose because I feel something that C Cormac McCarthy is very good at is capturing life on page. And that's just the way life is, you know? The highs wouldn't be as high if everything in your life would be that high and the lows wouldn't be that low if that was your baseline. Those first hundred pages for, in my opinion, are the baseline, if that makes sense. It is there, it's intentional. Looking back, there are amazing scenes like the thunderstorm, Blevins, oh my god, I love Blevins. And then when you get to the rest, it's just so much more rewarding. And something that is crazy is when I read the second chapter, I was like, this is actually one of the best things I've ever read in my life, what the fuck? And then I read chapter three and I was like, this is even better. And then the fourth one just, oh my gosh, it was, I actually felt like I was stabbed in the heart. It was, it was so beautiful. This book is so thematically rich, whether it's the romance with Alejandra and man, some of these lines are just the most romantic, beautiful sequences that I've ever read. For example, when John Grady first sees her, it says, he'd half meant to speak, but those eyes had altered the world forever in the space of a heartbeat. I mean, are you kidding? But the love story aspect is not the only part of this book that I absolutely adored. There's a lot here on loss of innocence, especially with this one character, Blevins. However, it's really seen through all the teenage characters to one extent or another. There's also so much discourse about the position of women in society, especially through this one character, um, Alejandra's aunt. She has like this entire monologue that goes on for like four pages. And I was like, 
how is Cormac McCarthy, who I thought before starting this was like a dude bro lit author, writing this very poignant commentary and it's so empathetic. Honestly, I've already reread that monologue maybe three times since finishing the book. Every time I reread it, I get something new out of it. You know, for me, I just think this book was the perfect introduction to Cormac McCarthy. One of the most beautiful books that I read in recent memory and I truly, truly cherish it. So then I decided that I should move on to his probably most popular book, which was The Road. And man, okay, I think after finishing this book, every single man who wants to become a father, this is mandatory reading. Honestly, if it was up to me, um, you know, when you get discharged from the hospital and you get your baby and whatever, um, you should also immediately get handed a copy of this book. And I'm only partially joking, okay. In this book, we follow a father and a son as we journey through this apocalyptic landscape infested with cannibals. Now, I'm not gonna tell you where they're heading because that's not really revealed to us from the beginning, but also I don't think it's that important. I think someone in a comment section told me that this was partial inspiration for The Last of Us, and I totally totally see it. However, I think Cormac did it better. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, I love The Last of Us, but when I finished this book, this is what I looked like. The writing style. Let's talk about it, right? Because everyone always wants to talk about Cormac McCarthy's sparse writing style. Um, sparse or effective? Because I'd say it's the latter. Cormac McCarthy's prose changes in every single book. I, that being said, I've only read four, but I think that's like an okay sample size to make this judgment. In every single book, the writing style is different. Are there things that carry from one book to another? Yes, he doesn't like to use apostrophes. Sometimes he'll miss a comma, but those are just like really superficial things. Uh, I think in All the Pretty Horses, it was what I considered like to be very standard for a Western. In The Road, the writing is much more artistic, I'd say. The paragraphs are very short. The dialogue is very short. However, the descriptions are beautiful. They're so lyrical. And when people say sparse, when at least what I think of is you just know the bare bones of what the situation is like, but that's not at all what this is here. For example, this is from page one, right? And you tell me if this is sparse or not. In the dream from which he'd wakened, he had wandered in a cave where the child led him by the hand, their light playing over the wet flowstone walls like pilgrims in a fable swallowed up and lost among the inward parts of some granitic beast. Deep stone flues where the water dripped and sang, tolling in the silence the minutes of the earth and the hours and the days of it and the years without cease. You think that's sparse? Girl. <laughs> now, there is the argument to be made that his, dia that his dialogue, especially in the road, is sparse. It's very direct. I just, I just think it's quite direct. He says exactly what needs to be said. For example, I'll read you this passage and tell me, is there anything else that needs to be said? And I, I don't think so. I think this passage is so, so effective. In context, the boy and the dad are talking about cannibalism because they're starving. So the boy asked the dad, we wouldn't ever eat anybody, would we? No, of course not. Even if we were starving, we're starving now. You said we weren't. I said we weren't dying. I didn't say we weren't starving, but we wouldn't. No, we wouldn't. No matter what, no matter what, because we're the good guys. Yes, and we're carrying the fire and we're carrying the fire, yes. Okay. I feel like McCarthy is such a master of language that he knows exactly what to say to capture a feeling or to capture a thought or to capture fear because fear is ever present here. Anxiety is ever present here. Like what more do you want? Like the people that complain about the sparse language, what more do you want? What would you change? I genuinely don't know. Also, I feel like McCarthy really captures positive masculinity. There's a lot of talk about toxic masculinity nowadays online and that's great, we should talk about it. But what about the positive masculinity? Well, I'd argue that McCarthy really I don't, really captures what it is. There are two things that I want to talk about in this book that I can't without spoilers, um, and so skip ahead to the next book. But the first one that I want to talk about is the scene of the dad washing out the uh, attacker's brains out of the kid's hair. It's just them in that cold lake in the mountain and the dad scraping the brains out of his son's hair. Uh, his son who's so traumatized that he won't talk to the dad who is curious if they are still the good guys, if they are murdering people. 
Can you imagine, like, uh, I don't have a child, but I assume that if you would have a child, that would be even more impactful to you. But I was reading that scene and I was like, man, honestly, I don't know what to say because I, I find myself at a loss for words oftentimes when I really like something. But it was one of the moments in the book when I was like, this book could actually traumatize me. And the other scene that killed me, it killed me, was the scene that the dad died in. The way it calls back to one of those first uh, dialogue moments that they have of the dad promising his kid that he'll never leave him. And then he says that you can continue on without me. We've been lucky. Maybe you won't be lucky again. I just, oh my God. Oh my God, man. It was one of the most heartbreaking things I ever read. And also as a parent, knowing when to remove yourself from your child so that they can prosper. The fear associated with that because they're alone, especially such a young boy, alone in the world full of cannibals, post-apocalyptic, whatever. It was so brilliantly written. I, I don't have words. I don't have words. After the road, I decided that I should go back to a Western, but I wasn't ready for Blood Meridian yet. And so I decided to read No Country for Old Men. We follow the entanglement of these three men called Anton Chigur, Llewellyn Moss, and Sheriff Bell. And it all starts when our boy Llewellyn does something really, really stupid. He accidentally stumbles onto this drug deal gone wrong, decides to take the money, but then he's like, mm, I'll return it actually. And then he's spotted and things go downhill from him for him. I think by far this was the most action-packed McCarthy book that I read for this video and so it gives almost like this thriller action vibe especially at the start and you know I often talk about oh this is a plot centric book this is a character centric book but this was like the character drove the plot does that make sense and that's exactly what I also love about Joe Abercrombie I'm sorry to bring him up again but it is. And so when I was reading No Country for Old Men, I was like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I love because it makes so much sense that these characters as people would choose to take these actions. And it's so clear, it's so logical that these actions would then have these consequences because of who the other characters involved are. However, at times I felt like perhaps the plot was so fast that I didn't really have that much time to breathe. And so it really made me appreciate the calmer moments in the book as well. The ones that I am specifically referencing is at the start of every single chapter we have a little interlude or a little I guess reflection from Belle. I really love when McCarthy through his characters muses on different real world issues but also because the book was over so fast after I finished it I just laid in bed thinking about it and there were three things that really really stood out to me. There was an interesting parallel between Chigurh and Belle and them following their principles because we have Belle who is monologuing at us about all these principles that he has and these morals that he follows. But then we find out later on that he deserted his friends in World War II. And then that is contrasted with Anton Chigurh who is so, so evil. However, there's the scene included fairly, I think like just before the midpoint of the book where he walks into this store and he decides if someone lives on or dies on a coin toss. And this person survives and Anton walks away and it's fine. And then later the scene is uh, kind of repeated, mirrored with a different character. Sugar ends up shooting this other character. And even though this character that does get shot is like, oh, you, you're doing this because you're a monster. You wouldn't have left me live. Anyway, we as the audience know that he would have let this character live. And so Chigurh is more of a man of principle than Belle. He's not more moral, but he follows his code of ethics more. Um, another thing that props up again and again and again in this book is this idea of luck, because this book, the, the entire plot happens <laughs> because Llewellyn destroys his life in one day because of bad luck. Like <laughs> that, that's literally what it is. And then luck comes back again and again. Even the coin toss scenes that I just mentioned, that's about luck as well. Third thing that I wanted to mention was the cultural changes between generations. I mean, Again, the country is changing. It's no country for old men. Ha ha ha. Cormac McCarthy is really funny. For example, at one point, Belle says, I agreed with him that there wasn't a whole lot good you could say about old age. And he said he knew one thing. And I said, what is that? And he said, 
it don't last long. I do think this is my least liked McCarthy so far. I really enjoyed it still, least liked. And I think this is the one time that the writing style, I think, inhibited me. What do I mean by that? While I was reading it, it felt very cinematic. And you might say, oh, cinematic maybe is like, does it? usually when someone says that the writing is cinematic, they mean it in a good way. Mm, in this way, you know how when you watch a movie, you only see what the camera sees? That's very much how I felt about this book. I, I could only see what was in the shot, but not the landscape around. I don't know if I'm making sense at all. Once again, I think this is just another point for Cormac McCarthy being a very versatile author because I didn't see this in any other of his books. But then I also found out that originally this was a screenplay, which was then turned into a book, which then was turned into another screenplay. But I think that the remnants of it being a screenplay are definitely felt. And so if you do pick it up, I'm curious if you'll kind of get that vibe as well. After No Country, it was time for the big boy. Blood Meridian. If you take away only one thing from this video, let it be this. Do not start your McCarthy journey with Blood Meridian. You know how I've been saying that the writing style changes drastically from book to book? Same thing. I'd say that it's most similar to All the Pretty Horses, but just way more dense. And when I say dense, I don't particularly mean difficult to read, though I think that that would... I, I do think it is harder to read on a structural level than any of the other books. What I mean is there are so many allusions and it's so dense with metaphor. I think that this is the book that I underlined the most. It had a different color for like things to do with like philosophy and God, color for prose poetry, red for violence obviously, and if you know anything about this book you know that it is very violent. In green I made notes about allusions that like I knew were there but that that I was missing, so I'd search it up. Blood Meridian follows the kid as he runs away from his home and joins up with Galanton's gang, who was a real life gang that went on scalping journeys. Is this a book that I really enjoyed? <laughs> no, I don't think that this is a book that you particularly are meant to enjoy, enjoy. It is a book that is supposed to, I think, make you think. Also, I was so, so impressed by this book. You know, people say that it is one of the great American novels and yeah, I mean, I haven't read many of the other contenders, but if they're on the level of Blood Meridian, boy, do I have to. This is a book that you have to reread. And when I do reread it next time, I want to first read uh, Moby Dick, probably reread The Odyssey because it's been like years since I read that and get a bit more well-versed about the Bible references that were in this book. Something that really frustrated me and this is totally on me is that I was reading it and I was like, okay, I know this is a reference or an allusion to something. I, I know it, but I didn't know what it was. And there were some situations where I was either too tired or like not bothered to search it up because like how often can you like turn to your phone and like search up another thing? Or there were sometimes situations where I knew an allusion was being made. I knew a metaphor was being made, but I, I wasn't sure what to look for. I wasn't sure which part of the passage was the illusion. And so that just really frustrated me because I knew something was going on that I was missing. I really wanted to get as much as I could out of Blood Meridian the first time through. Now, there was one part that I need to uh, tell you about because I am super proud of myself. The thing that I am referring to is there is a scene that involves like tarot card reading. Woman pulls out a uh, four of cups and there's some description of like, oh, the card looked vaguely familiar, and I cut where it was before. Proof, it's on page 63, the Four of Cups over here, and I searched it up, and from what I understood, it's uh, the card that means like apathy. And there's also a quote somewhere in here about if something shows up twice or more, then it's like significant. And so then I started thinking, okay, why did the kid get this card that is supposed to signify apathy. And so in my interpretation, which can be totally, totally wrong, I think the kid to a large extent is like a self insert character for us, the reader. And it's not that I'm saying that he doesn't have any character, he obviously does, but I think that we, it's very intentional that we are seeing a lot of these actions um, through his eyes, or at least that we are experiencing these things alongside him. And so we have a similar reaction to them as he does. Something that I noticed um, as I progressed through the book is how desensitized I get to the violence. The first few very violent scenes really stick with me. Uh, the baby tree, that's what I'm gonna say, uh, the church, 
uh, the first uh, battle scene. Oh my gosh, like those are imprinted in my brain. However, as I continued through the book and there was more and more violence, I think chapter 17 or 18 or 16, one of those three chapters anyway, is very, very, very violent. It's the entire chapter is just raid after raid and so much violence. However, I stopped really caring. And I know that's like awful to say, but I think that's the point as well, right? Because you slowly become so used to those descriptions and images that you just become apathetic. And so, I don't know, in my interpretation, that's why we are shown the card twice. I am so glad that I read this book and I can't wait to reread it in the future. Now, these are the four McCarthy books that I've read so far. However, I truly think that he could become a favorite author of mine. And so I may or may not have already planned two other McCarthy videos. <laughs> Brandon, I know you're watching. You were one of the first people to recommend Cormac McCarthy to me and you wanted me to read The Passenger and Stella Maris. And good news for you, they will be included in the next video. Anyway, it's been a while since an author has spoken to me the way Cormac McCarthy speaks to me. And it's so crazy because I kind of went into these books thinking that I would hate them, <laughs> like Loki. I know I'm not supposed to be biased when I start reading a book or whatever, but I really didn't love any Western that I read before these. Anyway, you can also follow me on my other social media like Goodreads and Instagram and recently Letterboxd. Um, but other than that, that's all for me. Let me know what you thought of these books and if you're gonna pick them up. Remember, if you're a father, you have to read The Road. Um, <laughs> and anyways, that's all from me and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.